Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to part two of Star Wars The Old Republic Unmasked. Throughout this video project, I again aim to discuss SWOTOR's decade-long history, focusing on each expansion, content patch, and community highlight, all in an effort to summarize SWOTOR's lifespan thus far. For those of you who may have missed part one, I have linked the video in the video description down below. I would strongly recommend you watch that video before watching this one. Anyway, with all that said, sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy yet another Star Wars The Old Republic video. Nothing is impossible with the force. It is an energy that flows through all living things, and like energy, it may be harnessed. On January 18th, 2012, SWOTOR would receive its very first content patch, henceforth referred to as Rise of the Rat Ghouls, officially game update 1.1. This patch would feature a new flashpoint based in the Tyon cluster. This new flashpoint would have players investigate a crash site on the planet of Kaon. Players once planetside would encounter a known deadly threat, this being the Rat Ghouls as seen on Taris and in previous KOTOR titles. The player and their party would fight through various infected and infected beasts, such as the Rat Ghoul Behemoth, in order to track down the source of the infection and rescue any survivors on Kaon, a somewhat monumental task for a single strike force. The Flashpoint Kaon Under Siege would be well received as SWOTOR's first official new contents, as the Flashpoint managed to keep the player base captivated enough to stay engaged with this new story arc, titled Rise of the Rat Ghouls. Alongside this content patch, players would also receive the nightmare variants of both Eternity Vault and the Kraga's Palace Raid. This new difficulty mode brought to the table a new level of challenge yet on scene within the SWOTOR MMO. And with the raiding community in a more stable position than launch, players managed to assemble their raid teams to take on the new raid mechanics as featured in both EV and KP. Dozens of teams worked tirelessly to theorycraft and gear up for the new raids, only to be surprised when a competitive progression guild named Condemned managed to push their way through all the new bosses in the Kraga's Palace operation, again on Nightmare difficulty, whilst also going on to defeat Soa, the final boss of EV, also on Nightmare difficulty that very same night. All of this while under the pressure of a pending maintenance patch scheduled for that following morning. Condemned single-handedly had managed to defeat Nightmare EV and Nightmare KP before most teams had even set foot in the operation. It was a truly remarkable progression experience that would forever be cemented in SWOTOR's history. Condemned had officially claimed both world firsts from Star Wars The Old Republic's very first Nightmare operations. At first, most every team was in disbelief at these world firsts, with constant controversy lasting months. Some opposing players claimed their success was due to their team being 16-man and utilizing exploits. Some claimed that they used exploits and cheats in general. Some thought these screenshots and videos provided were edited. Either way, there was a real shock factor at the fact a nightmare operation in Star Wars The Old Republic could be cleared the day of its release, whilst other competing MMOs, such as World of Warcraft, would usually take a few days slash weeks to clear some of its more harder content. Ultimately, however, Condemned would be recognized as taking the first 16-man nightmare operation clear and first clear of EV and KP respectively. This would be further recognized by most members of the nightmare community. Going forward, most teams would choose to recognize 8-man raiding as the preferred conventional raid format, as this was considered easier to monitor, but during this time, the World First was indeed done on a 16-man run. On March 12th, 2012, after the raid hype had died down, the developers released patch 1.2, the Legacy Update, which brought an abundance of new content to the game, including a follow-up flashpoint to Kaon Under Siege called Lost Island. Lost Island, similarly to its predecessor, followed the development of the Rise of the Rat Ghoul storyline and has players return to the starter planet of Ord Mantell to hunt down a Dr. Lorik. He's the supposed supplier of this new strain of Rat Ghoul Plague that is spreading quickly across the Tyon Cluster. Despite this interesting story development and more personal style flashpoint, Lost Island was not deemed by most to be the main selling point of patch 1.2, as players would take a much better liking to the numerous quality of life improvements and content additions that would shape the way we play SWOTOR today. The first of these advancements would be the new legacy system that gave players various upgrades across their characters. This exceeded one tune and applied a variety of upgrades to every tune associated with that player's account. This included character perks like ship unlocks, whereas the player could unlock training dummies, a GTN, and a mailbox within their own personal starship, eliminating the need for that player to travel back to their respective fleets. Players could also unlock rocket boots and XP gains alongside their use of the legacy system. 
Above all else, however, players could finally customise their user interface. Swotor was a game notorious for its lack of dependency on add-ons, and outright stated that the use of add-ons beyond combat logging would breach Swotor's TOS, which, unlike competitors at the time, meant players would be completely dependent on their own abilities for most tasks. But now with the ability to customise UIs, players could now sort and place their UI elements conveniently around their screen, thereby making the gameplay experience more bespoke for that player's individual needs. There were a few other perks, such as species unlocks, that allowed players to play different species alongside different classes, and even a new skill called Heroic Moment that allowed players to utilise the abilities of other max level tunes for a brief time, but this again could not be used in a competitive environment as the ability required an active companion. Nonetheless, these were still nifty additions to the game, as were most of these aforementioned perks. Update 1.2, therefore, was without a doubt one of the most iconic updates for SWOTOR, as this patch specifically helped personalise one owns MMO experience and made the game feel unique to each and every player. Players would also receive a new gearing experience to take place in the daily zone titled The Black Hole, which was an isolated section of the planet Corellia, where players could undergo weekly and daily tasks to acquire gear sets that could better prepare them for the newer operation content. This newer content is a raid called Explosive Conflict. EC brought with it real challenge to the MMO, with a keen arrangement of unique positioning mechanics that would redefine raid culture for the SWOTOR community, a raid culture that was now just beginning to blossom. Another highlight of patch 1.2's contents would be SWOTOR's first ever world event, nicknamed the Ratgall event. The event would make its debut on the planet Tatooine. During the event, players would be uniquely given a limited few weeks to complete an array of daily quests and hidden challenges in and around the Dune Sea of Tatooine. This would be following a story concerning a crashed starship that has contaminated the local fauna of Tatooine with a new strain of the Ratgall virus, in keeping with the rise of the Ratgall storyline. During the event, players would work alongside Thorn, a task force established to contain and cure the plague. The team's prime objective during the event was to investigate and cure the Star Dream Starship of the Ratgo infestation. The event went on to receive mass praise as players could effectively grind the reputation within the time frame and even obtain a variety of loots and cosmetics that would uniquely distinguish themselves from players who had not yet engaged in the event. This further encouraged a lot of interest in the event's activities. The event also brought an interesting take to the existing open world PvP in the game, as players could utilise the Ratgall Plague itself to infect other players. However, most players would spend their time carrying the plague around both the Imperial and Republic fleets, attempting to infect as many players as possible. The story of this Ratgall Plague ability was actually conceptualised from SWOTOR's major competitor, World of Warcraft, whereas Hacker the Soul Flare from the Zolgarub raid would infect players with a contagious debuff called Corrupted Blood. The debuff was intended to prevent players from standing too close to each other mid-raid, as the debuff itself did periodic damage. However, players managed to pull the debuff out of the instance using the Hunter's Pet, and in essence, use the debuff to cause havoc. Players would simply obtain the debuff, despawn the pet, and respawn it in a populated area, resulting in entire instances quickly becoming consumed by the plague. It is apparent that Swotor was heavily inspired by the Corrupted Blood incident, and used the tale as a basis for its own epidemic style event. Moving on to game update 1.3, which brings with it the highly controversial yet useful group finder tool. This system pairs players together in groups for various flashpoints and operation style contents. The system was simple and had already been tried and tested in World of Warcraft. Players would be able to select a preferred role within a group, whether that be tank, DPS or healer. Players could then choose the preferred flashpoint or operation content they would like to do, and just like that, the player would be paired with others featuring complementary roles for the group content. This group finder system simplified the group finding process entirely and removed the game's dependency on guilds or even friends to form groups. The controversy arose when founders and enjoyers of the original content complained about there no longer being an urgency to make friends in the game, especially for the lower tier content and more casual content. Players would complain that random players called pugs would be unreliable and less likely to know the group content than, say, friends within their guilds. World of Warcraft actually experienced similar teething complications when they added the Dungeon Finder system to the original World of Warcraft Cataclysm's update. Players equally complained about the sudden less dependency on guilds, which de-incentivized players from finding friend groups. However, with competitors switching to the Group Finder system, SWOTOR needed to keep competitive in order to keep the player base active, and to further yet, keep all their content as accessible as possible for every type of player. The Allies expansion further expanded on the existing legacy system by adding new bonuses which allowed players to travel to different planets and thereby further improve quality of life for players at SWOTOR's endgame. 
A few other additions came to gearing, such as adaptive gearing and augmentation kits that allow players to better customize and personalize their stats to better fit their playstyles. Whether or not this patch was considered good is in the eye of the beholder, as players by now were beginning to divide on Swotel's direction. Was this game an RPG, more comparable to a multiplayer KOTOR, or would this shift towards WoW-style content suggest Swotel would be more of a MMO than MMORPG? At this point, Star Wars The Old Republic had amassed a rather large following. 2 million units sold at launch, with a slowly declining but still firm 1.7 million subscribers. To enforce the game's marketing hype, Bioware further promoted SWOTOR on traditionally through pre-established mainstream shows such as The Big Bang Theory, a show released on CBS in America. During Season 5, Episode 19, The Big Bang Theory had the show's main characters attempting to play SWOTOR over its launch weekend. However, the character Sheldon was already scheduled to go to a birthday party and could therefore not play the game at release. Eventually, Sheldon weasels his way out of his plans and returns to play SWOTOR with his friends. Following the TV spot, Star Wars The Old Republic would go on to make headlines on various news channels and networks, but the Big Bang Theory's episode The Weekend Vortex would always be SWOTOR's primary television appearance. The Big Bang Theory naturally attracted a rather large audience of new players to the game, but due to the subscription model and purchase requirements, it was quite a sizable investment for some, leading to a set of choices that would change SWOTOR forever. In the meantime, however, Star Wars The Old Republic would host a celebration event. This event would serve to welcome the new player influx. The newly announced Grand Acquisition Race was an exclusive one-time event that would have SWOTOR subscribers assembled together to work with the Chevin conglomerate. Event quest givers would describe the event as an interstellar scavenger hunt. The player would be tasked with traveling across the galaxy to find rare items such as preserved Colocoid Queen Eggs, Lacan Orange Spheres, and even fossilized Crate Dragon Pearls, all of which are located in obscure regions across the galaxy. The main event quest had Imperial players travel to Droman Cast, whilst Republic players would travel to Coruscant, having both events conclude on the planet Nar Shaddaa. The event itself offered players some interesting rewards from named weapons to rare mounts. These rewards could be obtained by exchanging event tokens, called Tokens of Enrichment, that were obtained by completing quests and further selling various scavenger hunt items. Most of these formerly exclusive rewards would return to the game with the addition of the Cartel Bazaar in future patches. However, as with all events, the Grand Acquisition Race had some interesting stories. This specific story concerning a common bug that would occur during the bonus quest series. Despite the term bonus, the optional quests were somewhat mandatory as bonus quests contributed directly to these aforementioned rewards, as certain bonus quests would give the player items needed to fully complete the scavenger hunt. The bug itself came from players not doing their quote-unquote bonus quest and therefore not being able to complete the main storyline. Even if a player knew about the bug, other players could simply manipulate one another by sabotaging each other's quests. To elaborate, all these scavenger hunt items were in public instances. Players were therefore able to interact with other players' scavenger hunt items. For example, a droid on Droman Cast required players to repair the droid before rewarding a scavenger hunt item. Other players could simply walk over, repair another player's droid, and make it impossible for them to complete the quest. Community manager Joseph Gonzalez stated, If you ever get frustrated and delete a bonus mission during the Grand Acquisition Race's main mission, the easier way to get it back is to reset the main mission for this event. You'll still retain all of your previous items and you will only lose the progress that you've made towards the current item that you're pursuing. Hope that helps. This semi-fix worked for most players but left a little dissatisfied with the event as of its very competitive nature. Ultimately, the Grand Acquisition Race eventually concluded and players who managed to avoid the various bugs and issues would manage to cash out tokens for their rewards and wrap up the event overall on a high note. For those less lucky few, however, Bioware still had more group content ready to ship for update 1.4, this being the new raid, the Terror from Beyond. The new operation would have players travel to the Greek controlled planet of Astion. The player would then be tasked with closing the ancient Hypergate and battling against the notorious Dread Masters and their minions. Eventually, players would make their way through the raid and onto a final boss fight against the Terror from Beyond itself, this being a monstrous horror from beyond the Hypergate. Terror from Beyond was one of the most debated and heated raids to ever be released to SWOTOR. Players were truly impressed by the new incredible mechanics that the raid possessed, from Operator's color mechanics to TFB's tentacle slams. Alongside this, TFB also brought with it a new mysterious questline unlike anything the MMO had ever seen. This mysterious quest started within a hidden zone within the instance. This zone had hundreds of raiders theory crafting on the forums, trying to work out the intended purpose of this now known secret room. 
Players eventually uncovered in following patches that if all members of the raid had the Dread Mask and an amulet, as obtained from 10 stack Dreadtooth, this being the World Boss for Section X, then the zone itself would spawn a secret boss called the Dreadful Entity, which was revealed to be the first half of an otherwise greater secret boss called the Hateful Entity. As with most raids in Star Wars The Old Republic, Terra From Beyond was eventually cleared on both story mode and hard mode, with players celebrating their victories in preparation for the soon to be added Nightmare variant. More controversy arose with the Nightmare variant of the raid's release. In later patches, specifically patch 2.2, the second boss of TFB, Dread Guards, proved to be a somewhat troublesome encounter, with the content being arguably undoable. Top tier raid teams and former record holders even went as far as to declare that the Dread Guard encounter was mathematically impossible, specifically within context to DPS, as most top tier raid teams were hitting the bosses in rage timer at roughly 40% on the last Dread Guard. This being significantly too high, especially considering these were top tier raiders. This caused a lot of frustration, as it took Bioware some time to address the issue, leading to teams over-analyzing the boss, going as far as to believe that there was perhaps a specific mechanic that was being mismanaged, thus resulting in hours of unjustified theory crafting for what should have been achievable clears. Some teams even took advantage of this issue, going as far as to skip the boss via exploits, and then go on to clear the final boss of the operation whilst other teams were distracted. These clears were arguably illegitimate, but earned a guild by the name of Death and Taxes a world first kill due to a technicality following the exploitation of the Dreadguard boss. This clear was considered a cheated clear by the Nightmare community and disqualified the team from progression. Eventually, the developers did retune the Dreadguard encounter by lowering the DPS requirement. This enabled the first full Nightmare clear and world first instance clear of Terra from Beyonds to be nabbed by the Nightmare Progression Guild Hatred on June the 26th, 2013 at 12.45 a.m. PDT. There was a lot of debate about the world first with competing guilds Suckerfish and Severity Gaming coming close to claiming the title, but Hatred ultimately took the recorded title as the first official TFB NIM clear. Prior to this, however, Star Wars The Old Republic was still undergoing a massive change. Story Mode TFB had just come out, and players were hungry for more content. Due to the pre-established marketing hype, as referenced in the TV spot, accompanying the unconventional nature of a subscription model fee at the time, the majority of the mainstream player base had no desire to access SWOTOR, despite there being a huge influx of interest from the various marketing platforms. Electronic Arts and subsidiary Bioware ultimately knew that they would need to access this greater market in order to take full advantage of the interest revolving around the game. In response, Bioware and EA would go on to officially announce the game-changing free-to-play model. Free-to-play, as not to discourage subscribers, offered a limited experience of the game. This limited experience allowed players to access the eight distinctive class stories, each with three chapters across 12 planets, alongside the planetary missions and various exploration quests. F2P players, as they would now be referred to, were also still able to access repeatable heroics, and even the entire leveling experience from level 1 to 50. You could even run flashpoints, which begs the question, why subscribe? Well, the developers decided to issue some limits to F2P players. For example, free-to-play players would have limited character creation options, making them less customizable. Additionally, F2P players would be restricted to only three war zones, three flashpoints, and three space missions a week, which for a game as moorish as an MMORPG was a real burden for your average player. Free-to-play players would also not be allowed to take part in raid contents without an operation pass, which was unlocked via cartel coins, and worse yet, F2P players could not equip purple artifact quality items, which left them at a disadvantage statistically to subscribed players. Alongside this, there were also an abundance of quality of life improvements that were revoked for free-to-play players, including longer cooldowns for quick travel and emergency fleet passes, as well as severe utility limitations, such as the restricted to five field revivals and having to wait longer in server logging queues. It, it was clear that the developers were, instead of adding content for subscribers, instead crippling free-to-play players. As a gesture, the free-to-play model was received well, but in practice, F2P players were severely disadvantaged to subscribers. In Bioware's defense, the preferred player role would eventually be introduced, which did mitigate some of the changes of free-to-play, but this required a player to spend money, at least $5 on the game, which was essentially half a month's subscription at the time. 
Regardless, free-to-play was still a welcomed addition to the game, and to make the update more appealing than just a free-to-play update, the developers released a cinematic trailer alongside the announcement, this being the HK51 Activate trailer, which due to its unconventional reveal, misled the masses into believing that the trailer was a teaser for a larger trailer. Unfortunately this was not the case, and the trailer was instead a tease for the new HK51 companion droid that would be obtained in a similar fashion to the Grand Acquisition race, in the sense that players would be sent on a scavenger hunt to search for various HK51 parts across the galaxy. This new companion dropped with the aforementioned Bell Savis Daily Zone titled Section X, alongside its respective world boss Dreadtooth and the final alteration of the explosive conflict raid, this being Nightmare EC. The new Nightmare mode of Explosive Conflict released in patch 1.5 would bring with it modified boss encounters and challenges, being marketed with the tagline of most challenging operation to date, which with its two major competitors, Kraga's Palace and Eternity Vault, only offering similar mechanics to the hard mode variant, it would actually make sense for EC to be the hardest of the operations. Explosive Conflict in itself would set the bar for all SWOTOR's future operation content as every raid following EC, including TFB, would receive new mechanics alongside their various Nightmare variants. Both Kraga's Palace and Eternity Vault featured little more than upscale checks to accommodate the difficulty, rather than full boss fight overhauls like EC, thus making EC, for most at least, the preferred form of nightmare raiding. The deal for clearing this content on Nightmare difficulty was also sweetened by the addition of a unique mount titled the Avalanche Heavy Tank as a possible reward drop for defeating any boss in the operation on Nightmare difficulty. Eventually the mount would be added to all difficulties with a slightly rarer drop chance, but for this limited period it was a highly fought after Nightmare mount. On release, dozens of teams would set out to complete Explosive Conflict and achieve World First. The raid's race to World First was highly competitive, more so than EV and KPs, with teams being more prepared and organised for this content patch, having more time to have honed and perfected their skills in previous patches. The following morning of the raid's release, however, the operation would be cleared by a group called Archetype of the Red Eclipse server, earning them the World First for EC Nightmare. With a new companion, new zone, and new free-to-play and preferred model, all alongside a nightmare version of the Explosive Conflict Raid, players had so much content to engage with. Under normal circumstances, players would have been thrilled by this bounty of exceptional content. However, despite the positive reception of the contents, a new highly endorsed subsystem in SWOTOR would unfortunately overshadow all of Patch 1.5. The system in question would change SWOTOR forever and firmly influence the MMO's direction for years to come. Which brings us to the final installment of Patch 1.5, and the implementation of the cartel market. Why don't we try something a little different? In a while since I had a decent challenge, I'm taking this opportunity to show my clan how it's done. The cartel market was an in-game cash shop that utilised microtransactions to allow players to purchase an in-game currency called cartel coins. This virtual currency could be used to purchase a surprisingly large range of items including exclusive armour sets, exclusive pets, exclusive speeders and XP boosts. Free to play players could even use the cash shop to buy Operation and Warzone passes, thereby overriding some of their free to play restrictions. The heavily endorsed cartel market system was initially met with a wave of criticism. Players could now purchase strategic advantage from the in-game store, whether these advantages were to quicker the leveling process, upgrade a character, or even utilise various fast travel passes, players who had access to the store could abuse it greatly. Despite these annoyances, the majority of the player base were reluctantly okay with this slight advantage paying players would obtain through the system. However, the real controversy arose when it was discovered that these items and utilities were not exclusive to one's legacy, but could also be sold on the Galactic Trade Network, this being the in-game auction house system. Due to players being able to purchase items through cartel coins and then sell them for the in-game currency called credits, it became clear to some that SWOTOR would technically be a pay-to-win MMORPG, which means players can indirectly purchase items or abilities that gave them a distinctive advantage over other players. In SWOTOR's case, players could simply buy an item with cartel coins, sell it on the GTN, and use the credits obtained to buy augments, gear, weapons, or even crafting resources from NPC vendors in the game. There were some preventative measures to assure the best gear could not be purchased, by having said gear locked behind in-game content, but beside that single exception, most of the game was now more accessible for a pay-to-win player than a free-to-play preferred or even subscribed player. 
You could argue, however, that the cartel coin system was not exclusive to cash purchase only. Players could earn a small amount of cartel coins by completing various achievements. These achievements would often reward 10 to 50 cartel coins, but most of these achievements would be rather lengthy to obtain and could only be achieved once per legacy. Players with every single achievement could only earn roughly 1,500 cartel coins at the time the cartel market was released, and this required players to complete every single storyline, event, and location achievement in the game, totaling thousands upon thousands of hours, with players not even coming close to that milestone even to this day, despite the game being out for over a decade now. And when players can purchase cartel coins that cost roughly $20 for 2,400 CC, you can see why players were quick to opt in for the cash option. There were other means of obtaining cartel coins, but unlike achievements, this again was coated with a thin line of controversy, this being the Refer a Friend program. The referral system was incredibly simple, subscribed players were given a unique referral link that they could send to other players to invite them to the game. Both players upon using the link would receive a variety of rewards. The new player, or the player who clicked the link, would receive free access to character titles and the Unify Coloured feature, which was originally only available to subscribed players, whilst further receiving a Jumpstart bundle which included one quick travel pass, five minor XP boosts, a crew skill unlock, and an inventory expansion module. This, to most players, would not be considered a huge number of items, but still better than nothing. However, players who managed to refer their friends would receive a complimentary 500 cartel coin grant, plus 100 additional cartel coins for every month that the referred player remained subscribed. Referees would additionally receive special in-game rewards from the Kurtob Alliance Speeder to an array of battle droid pets, one new pet for each friend referred, up to five. This system favoured players with lots of friends and contacts to bring to SWOTOR. I personally knew players who managed to move their entire guilds from competing MMOs like World of Warcraft and have each and every guild member refer to them, resulting in that player receiving tens of thousands of cartel coins monthly. This system, as you can imagine, was made even more appealing when contrasted against players who had only amassed 1,500 cartel coins through achievement farming. This obvious downside was only the tip of the iceberg, as this RAF system was completely exploitable. As players simply had to click the link to refer someone, this referral, once accepted, could not be undone or changed for at least 90 days, meaning if the player was subscribed or was planning to subscribe in that period, he would give the referrer 500 cartel coins regardless. Players could simply post their referral link anywhere online, and people with a SWOTOR account signed in could very easily refer another player without knowing the context. This infamous trick was called the referral scam, and preyed on new players who were unaware of the system to generate large numbers of cartel coins for themselves. Over time, as the scam evolved, players would send their own referral link in the game's general chat, with the promise that they would send credits to anyone who clicked their referral link. New players in need of credits would click the link, expecting the aforementioned prizes and credits, only to find that they had been blocked by the referrer and that their account was now referred to some random player, who had obviously used them for the cartel coins. For a few years, Reddit threads and forum posts erupted about the constant spam in general chat services from these scammers. Years went by without response, almost a decade in fact, but finally in April 2021 with patch 6.3, Bioware removed the system altogether, which affected a lot of the community as some content creators relied on the referral program to help in the making of their contents, as content creators could use the freely earned cartel coins to purchase items on the cartel store that would otherwise be quite expensive, especially when some SWOTOR content creators do reviews and document every item in the game. Understandably, the developers removed the system due to its exploitative nature, meaning cartel coins would need to be earned through either achievements or payment. Cartel coins have always been one of SWOTOR's primary sources of income alongside subscription. In fact, after SWOTOR's annual report following the cartel market's release, the player base was relatively blown away to see how financially successful the system was, and to further observe the new sales figures as they were announced. Star Wars The Old Republic reportedly made $344 million in its first financial year, this being 2012, which covered the initial development costs and even earned the game a cosy profit. In 2013, SWOTOR's financial figures appeared in an official analytic statement by Superdata Research, a subsidiary of the Nielsen Holdings Company. The information released through this site would suggest that SWOTOR's second full year concerning additional revenue outside of the subscription model, so through microtransactions, that the game had generated $139 million in revenue alone, just shy of the $165 million it would make from subscriptions that same year. SWOTOR's overall 2013 revenue, therefore, was $304 million, 
Across the game's decade-long lifespan, Swordwell has reportedly cleared over a billion dollars in revenue. It is worth bearing in mind that the development costs are still going up as the game remains live with active content patches and expansions being released. It is also unclear how much Electronic Arts spends on Swotor currently. We are aware of some outsourcing to freelancers and small studios for some of its contents, but there is no reliable information indicating Swotor's spendings to its earnings, not even in public shareholder reports. To refocus on the reported earnings through the cartel market, this being $139 million, it is clear that from a financial perspective, Swotor's in-game store would be an equal focus going forward, as Bioware would henceforth release newer and bigger cartel market patches and content crates for years to come. And with some of Electronic Arts' former business strategies, some of which suggesting a primary focus on microtransaction systems, as seen in other EA titles such as Battlefront 2, it was inevitable that the cartel market, despite its controversy, was here to stay. As mentioned, an in-game cash shop of this size and scale was generating a lot of income for Bioware and parent company EA. The system itself seemed to encourage players of all content types to financially invest in its contents, whether it be PvPers, PvEers, or RPers. Ultimately, this store offered something for everyone for the right price. With pay-to-win elements and the referral system aside, there were still plenty of problems with the cartel market at release, some of which would drive debate even to this day. The most key topic of discussion in these debates would often be gambling addiction. There was a further gambling element connected to the cartel market, and the prime contributor of this element was a probability loot crate called a cartel crate. Hidden within these crates were a random assortment of cartel market items of varying value. Worst yet, some of these crates offered unique items only obtainable through cartel crates. These crates, depending on the type, would cost anywhere between 160 to 360 cartel coins, with an upgraded variant called a hyper crate, which consisted of 24 regular crates, costing anywhere between 7,680 cartel coins to 8,640, depending again on the type of crate. In terms of real cost, this would infer crates cost on average £3 or $4 per regular cartel crate. This complication would expand throughout Electronic Arts' other titles until eventually EA would have to face legal committees in various countries across Europe, including the United Kingdom, and even go on to face further issues in the United States, especially in Hawaii. All for EA's newer title, Star Wars Battlefront 2, which also dabbled in loot boxes, similarly to SWOTOR. Speaking of controversy, Bioware hit its first major backlash upon announcing a new addition to the cartel market that would cement the system as a means of superseding actual gameplay, this being the addition of a universal companion called Treek. Treek was added in patch 2.3 and was the first Ewok companion available in the game. In fact, Treek was the first Ewok model in the MMO, a beloved species within the Star Wars universe that was reminiscent of the original Star Wars trilogy as featured in The Return of the Jedi. Treek was initially purchased for 1 million credits and required Legacy Level 40. The Legacy system at this point in time was rather bare, having little rewards for the hard work players were putting in to increase their Legacy level. However, to the player base's surprise, Treek appeared on the cartel market and was now purchasable for 2,100 cartel coins, or roughly $20. This outraged players, as those who had worked hard to level up their Legacy were suddenly having items exclusive to them available on the in-game cash shop. The legacy system furthermore was no joke, requiring players to level up multiple tunes in order to level up their legacy level, with most only achieving the max of legacy level 50 after completing all 8 class storylines or doing the equivalent in expanded content across all of their tunes. The backlash, though unpleasant, was not massively disappointing for every player, as some could care less about companions and their availability. But for completionists and devoted players, it is understandable why Treek's appearance on the cartel market was as controversial as it was. And that concludes the initial drop of the cartel market, and brings us to the event that preceded the addition of Game Update 2.0, a small content patch that quickly became a community favourite, ushering in the new Ilum update, a complete planet overhaul event titled The Return of the Gree. At the start of 2013 and the start of SWOTOR's second year, a pre-expansion patch titled Return of the Gree was dropped. This expansion contained within it the Gree event, a world PvP event exclusive to Ilum that brought event rewards, gear, and further boss content. The event took place on the planet of Ilum, which was initially a beloved leveling zone featuring the aforementioned Malga story arc, alongside a plethora of endgame players focused on open world PvP. The Gree event itself would function similarly to the Grand Acquisition event and the Rise of the Ratgull event, in the sense that it was too a time-gated event only available for a few weeks at a time. 
The event would have players explore an ancient vessel on the western shelf of Ilum in hopes of seeking knowledge lost to the eons. Players would quest in the zone, aiding the Gree with their studies and experiments, whilst also leveling up a new subsystem. Unlike prior events, the Gree event implemented the Reputation system that allowed players to level up a standing with the faction, starting at Outsider and ending at Legend. This system would also be added to prior events and would determine what event-specific items that player could purchase and when, with the rarest and most desirable items being available at higher reputation levels. Like many of SWOTOR's subsystems, the reputation system was inspired by World of Warcraft and similar MMORPGs at the time, with one of the earliest examples being the Karma system in Nine Dragons by Jun Wong Games. The earliest inspirations are what shaped the reputation system in MMORPGs today, and contribute greatly to why SWOTOR's reputation system has been such a successful tool at keeping players engaged with the MMO for longer periods of time. The Gree event was Star Wars The Odd Republic's first unique reputation-based event, having players explore the planet Ilum to obtain legendary status before the event ended. This however could not be achieved in one event cycle, as players would reach a weekly cap after questing too much, and players could only obtain so many reputation items each week, based on the number of quests they could finish in the given time period, which ultimately encouraged players to keep coming back to the game, providing SWOTOR with tons of replayability, as players would want to constantly return to participate in each event as it would reappear. Focusing on reputation items themselves, they were event-specific items that granted a small, medium, or large amount of reputation within a predefined range. Players found, however, that one could store legacy items forever in their inventory and continue to use them after the event had ended. However, due to item limitations, this had to be done through multiple tunes, as players could only gain a limited number of points per week, which was initially 12,000 points, and with the legend status requiring 70,000 points, it was clear that this would not be possible in an event lasting one to two weeks without switching tunes. Therefore, players used this legacy hoarding technique to obtain an abundance of items, with the first players being able to achieve legend standing within the first six weeks following the event. This event item hoarding technique further incentivized more players to make more tunes and further supported legacy players as they would already have a sufficient number of tunes needed to farm the event. As for the event itself, players were given numerous fetch quests and exploration quests to complete in order to gather event items. Some quest lines had players travel the galaxy to speak to various Gree droids, whilst others would have players fight specific event bosses that further dropped more event items. The penultimate boss of this event would be the Xeno Analyst, a droid boss with a few mechanics and checks for players to experience alongside the event quests. Overall, the Gree event was well received and was an exceptional precursor to the upcoming expansion. Star Wars The Old Republic's first content expansion, which surprised players and gave way to a new era of adventure. Our lives have been on the line before, but this is different somehow. It feels more immediate, more final. Introducing Star Wars The Old Republic's Rise of the Hutt Cartel, which was the first digital expansion pack for the MMORPG. ROTHC was pre-orderable and offered unique pre-order perks, one being a new title, Scourge of the Hutt, another being a new Macrin Creeper Seedling Pet, and finally the Dr. Orgrub Hutt Hollow Statue. The expansion was released on April 14th, 2013 as part of Game Update 2.0. It takes place on the new planet of Makeb and is centered around the Hutt Cartel. Content highlights include the increase of the level cap from 50 to now 55, legacy achievements, a new planet, and of course, a new boss. The Rise of the Hutt Cartel expansion would take place for the most part on the neutral world of Makeb, whereas the new leader of the Hutt Cartel, Taboro, would rule over the planet with an iron fist. Makeb was home to a resource known as Isotope 5, a tremendously powerful energy source that the new leader of the Hutt Cartel planned to use to overthrow both the Republic and the Empire respectively. Taboro aimed to make the Huts the galaxy's largest superpower. During the Hut Cartel's occupation of the planet Makeb, alongside their accompanying mining operations, Taboro managed to damage the world's core and leave the planet in an unstable state that would eventually lead to the planet's destruction. Imperial players were tasked with securing as much Isotope 5 as possible, whilst Republic players came to aid the oppressed people of Makeb. Eventually, Taboro would turn his back on the Hut Cartel altogether, and a combined force of Republic, Imperial, and Hut officials would ensure the downfall of the Hut's former leader. Once the smoke had cleared, the Republic gained a powerful ally in the Hut Cartel, but the Empire made off with a large supply of Isotope 5, which gave them significant advantage in the war effort. ROTHC's unique spin on the traditional MMO expansion, alongside its vast story, brought with it a plentitude of content. 
from new reputation factions to new daily quests and objectives for players to engage with whilst exploring the new planet of Makeb. The world zone itself was extraordinarily large, with multiple sections and zones allocated for story progression. These zones further offered unique heroic instances and regions that gave the contents a more cooperative feel. Furthermore, both the Republic and Imperial factions featured their own array of reputation-based quests alongside their own spin on the Makeb narrative, meaning players would receive a different experience depending on which faction they played. Unsurprisingly, the Makeb zones followed the same style and form of content as seen in previous patches, featuring primarily interactive fetch quests and NPC elimination quests. These quests weren't groundbreaking or very unique, but as expansions go, it's fair to say the Rise of the Hut Cartel was a safer, more traditional style of expansion, especially when compared to content being produced by competitors at the time. For example, World of Warcraft's Mist of Pandaria was facing backlash over the Pandaren race and unconventional questing, all whilst Final Fantasy XIV was being completely reworked and renamed for that matter to Final Fantasy A Realm Reborn. For this period of time in Star Wars The Old Republic's life cycle, it stood out as arguably one of the more secure MMOs, featuring a solid story and content direction, as well as a firm grasp on the market, as we know from the sales figures. All this while competitors fought heavily against their fan bases. It is arguable, therefore, that Swotor was in a good position during 2.0. However, this lack of deviation from the traditional MMORPG algorithm wasn't beloved by all. The MMO grind for 2.0 specifically did leave a sour taste in the mouths of a fair few players as evident by a common argument regularly repeated on the forums concerning mob placement and grind requirements. These comments go hand in hand as mob placement on Makeb was rather poor with most regions being absolutely infested even when unjustified and due to this excessive use of mobs as filler content associated achievements were also therefore overtuned to compensate often requiring 5,000 kills to 100% all mob-related achievements in a given region. To add insult to injury, the non-combatant NPCs would also sometimes aggro onto the player, triggering the combat mode, which would slow down the player and make it difficult to evade other groups of enemies, resulting in players being swarmed or having to wait an unreasonable amount of time for combat to end. This was disappointing and frustrating, but was somewhat manageable as an obstacle on the planet. This small bump had an impact on the player base, but did not deter the average player, as Bioware did fortunately release a new operation. The then called Legions of Scum and Villainy, now simply Scum and Villainy, was Swotor's fifth operation. The raid brought with it a whopping six encounters and one secret boss named the Hateful Entity, following from TFB's own Dreadful Entity. The raid was, with the bonus boss included, seven encounters long, making it Swotor's longest operation to date. Following from the success of EV, KP, EC and TFB, Scum and Villainy brought an array of new mechanics to the table, from timed hunting events to unique enrage timers that kept players on their feet. As with every prior operation, Scum and Villainy would receive its own Nightmare variant with Game Update 2.2, which would bring new Nightmare mechanics and challenges that made each encounter more troublesome to overcome, with some bosses taking days to theorycraft and surpass. Two prime examples of this would be the Cartel Warlords and Dreadmaster Styrak himself. Eventually, however, the guild Drop It Like It's Hoth would go on to kill Styrak on the 19th of July 2013 at 8pm, nine days after the content had released. The guild would go on to take the world first instance clear and first kill of Dreadmaster Styrak. The biggest official disappointment for 2.0's operation scene was the signature raid for Makeb, this being Taboro's Courtyard, as the operation itself only had one boss, similar in style to Xeno Analyst, as featured alongside the Gree event. Troubled players were beginning to wonder if operation content was being compressed down into individual bosses, which took a toll on the community, leading to rumours specifically about content being cut from the game. And so had it, players would venture on huge data dives to uncover more information, and to the community's surprise, this was not some underworld market conspiracy, but a concern backed by evidence, leading to the notorious data leak of 2.0, or as some referred to it, what Swotor could have been. The initial leak took the community by storm, with full scripts, unfinished zones, quest directories, planetary hubs, and potential story spoilers littering the game files. Data miners spent weeks picking apart the scattered files and leaking them on various sites such as Reddit, the forums, and other community channels. A well-known anonymous data leaker by the name of Swotor Miner found traces of two new planets in the game files, the first being Slaheron. Supposedly, the planet of Makeb was not the only planet in development prior to 2.0's release, as Slaheron was originally meant to contain class stories for both the Republic and the Empire. 
The Imperial story followed Imperial scientists, led by Darth Kalumenia, an unknown Sith figure, whilst the Republic story would feature Republic scouts, led by a Commander Nikos. The planet of Slaheron was in fact already known canonically by the KOTOR community, as the planet was originally pitched for the first KOTOR game, but was in fact cut fairly early on during development. Bioware originally produced screenshots of the planet for advertisement purposes, distributing said screenshots to Lucasfilm and the press in hope of building hype around this experimental title, this of course being KOTOR. But due to budgetary restraints and time limitations, the planet was ultimately cut from KOTOR 1, and this new look at the planet would be a huge motivator for SWOTOR fans going forward. SWOTOR Minor further uncovered data files concerning the planet of Botham Wui, which was data mined alongside the planet Slaheron. This planet was also intended to release with 2.0, but was believed to be cut due to, again, budgeting problems. Botham Wui is best known for its featuring in the original SWOTOR timeline promotional videos that discuss the lore of various planets around the galaxy. This video specifically discusses Botham Wui and the Imperial takeover of the planet in 3671 BBY, 18 years before the Treaty of Coruscant. Alongside this data leak, two other planets made an appearance, these being both the original Zyost, as seen in later expansions, alongside mysterious files mentoring the Emperor's planet, which would strongly suggest connotations to the believed defeated immortal Emperor. This again had various story implications that entertained the official SWOTOR Reddit page for many months following the data leak. The storyline of Zyos was similar to that of Botham Wui and Slaheron, and again would be class specific. To reference one such class, the warrior story for example had players fight against Nostaral in the Han's fortress on Zyost, similarly to the current Osa storyline. Whilst the Inquisitor would go on to the Emperor's Tower and help various Dark Council members with tasks, the Bounty Hunter and Agent also had storylines featured alongside the planet. It was truly a huge data leak with tons of content. Ultimately, unlike Slaheron and Botham Wui, Zyos was eventually released in later expansions, but was again somewhat different than the data leak would have suggested. There were other minor data leaks at that time as well, such as the leaked planet of Varl and the Imperial Warlord Flashpoint, as well as other unrelated gameplay features, but ultimately this data leak provided a lot of confusion and hype at the same time. Today, this simply is a testament to the creative process the developers go through during production, and it's interesting in hindsight to see what made it to the game in the end, and what was unfortunately scrapped. With that said, SWOTOR's 2.0 was indeed an expansion of much debate, theory crafting, data mining, and community engagement. This standard style of content featured in the expansion would enforce the foundations of the MMORPG and give SWOTOR a fighting chance against its more volatile competitors. But saying Bioware didn't experiment at all this expansion wouldn't be entirely true as a new subsystem was in fact introduced. Two new devices made their way to the game that would feature alongside a side story questline. These items were named Macro Binoculars and Seeker Droids. The Macro Binoculars and Seeker Droid items were uniquely packaged with a storyline sequence. Players could expect a different variation of said storyline depending on their faction. This would total four new side story quests that utilised these items across both the Republic and the Empire. Republic players would work with Dina Riss for the Macro Binoculars questline and Master Jen for the Seeker Droid questline. Imperial players would work for Darth Mortis and his ally Evie Bow following the Macro Binoculars questline, as well as Darth Asina for the Seeker Droid questline. As with the rest of the contents following Expansion 2.0, the storyline mirrored slightly for both sides. The Macro Binoculars questline had players pursue a legendary freelance spy named the Shroud, who was attempting to inflict massive terrorist attacks on both the Republic and Imperial homeworlds, as hired to do so by the Huts whilst the Seeker Droid questline had players hunt down ancient Sith artifacts known as Seeds of Rage. The Dread Seeds were used to harness the dark side of the Force and to manipulate life. The Seeds would slowly corrupt everything in their path, if not stopped. The player would discover that the Dread Masters were responsible for the distribution of these Seeds and would need to be defeated. The mechanics of these items themselves were relatively simple. As the name implies, the macro binoculars were simply first-person binoculars that enabled the player to look around the environment freely. The player could then zoom in on items of interest and scan them to further missions or unlock various paths. The main feature of these macro binoculars included its ability to interact with tech from a distance and its further ability to scan targets for analysis. 
whilst the secret droids were a little more complicated, but fundamentally it would allow the player to search a 5 meter radius at a desired location, whereas players could use the macro binoculars to find dig sites on planets, and from there, know approximately where you would need to position yourself to receive signals from the seeker droid. The droid would then scan for any buried items. If one is found, it automatically extracts the item and returns it to the player. If not, an indicator will appear that suggests either another dig site or an area nearby to dig. The seeker droid would use hints to indicate how close the player was to an item at the dig site, and players would have to follow prompts on screen to find any hidden items in that area. Referring back to the quest lines, both quests ended with a Heroic 4 instance quest that requires players to use their new items alongside other players to complete the quest line. Republic players would receive the two Heroics, on routing the Last Seed and the Shroud Revealed, whilst Imperial players would receive the Shroud's Last Stand and the Alchemy of Evil, which were essentially mirror quests. Upon completing the main quest line, players could in fact use the Seeker Droid further to unlock unique cosmetics and other miscellaneous loot relevant to the expansion. Each dig site would offer a varying piece of gear with a low spawn rate. Players could then fight it out to obtain these hidden gear sets across the galaxy. There were two uniquely themed sets available via Seeker Droids for this event. These were the Dreadseed armor sets and the Star Forager armor sets, both available from dig sites. Finally, there was a reputation system again integrated into this subsystem. This one was called the Galactic Solutions Industries, aka GSI, for players who actively farmed the Seeker Droid and Macro Binocular submissions. The event itself would offer some unique rewards, including the GSI PMP06 Pleasure Speeder, MKI armor sets, and more uniquely, Triangulation Enhancements. These were items that would increase the Seeker Droid's scan range, thereby making quests and farming items easier. The GSI, Seeker Droid, and Macro Binoculars subsystems with its quests went down relatively well. It was a little repetitive and a little bit grindy, but interesting and unique. Experimenting in this way is something that shouldn't be frowned upon, and I think it's fair to say that every MMO should try and make an effort to expand the genre and contribute to adding a uniqueness to the gaming industry. SWOTOR's 2.0 was a smooth enough launch, a little bumpy at times with small amounts of controversy, but nothing we haven't seen before. Well, saying that, Bioware did take a small step back before taking its big leap forward. As to the community's surprise, the Rise of the Hutt Cartel expansion made headlines yet again. Similarly in style to the Vet Slave controversy, Bioware had again managed to cause a bit of an uproar. This time by suddenly introducing a same-sex relationship to the game, which, bear in mind, should have been available at launch, especially when Bioware's other IPs offer same-sex relationships. I'm of course referring to Dragon Age and Mass Effect. Bioware was known for its open support of the LGBTQ plus community, but for whatever reason, Bioware excluded same-sex relationships at release, choosing instead to only feature heterosexual interaction. Again, an odd decision considering this is Bioware. Due to the abruptness of the change, media outlets suddenly tagged the planet of Makeb as the quote-unquote gay planet, as Makeb was now the only planet you could have a same-sex relationship on. Following the media's tagging of the term, the community began to refer to the incident as the gay planet controversy. Bioware following the justified backlash henceforth made sure to allow same-sex relations for most if not every romance going forward. The controversy became a common point of discussion alongside the reputation grind of Makeb, but had little impact on the player base and day-to-day -day within the MMORPG. As time passed, Bioware would eventually add some quality of life improvements to 2.0, from customization changes to new collection systems that connected well to the cartel market items via Legacy. Eventually, Bioware released 2.0's first full content patch, Patch 2.3, Titans of the Industry. With Patch 2.3, Titans of the Industry, players would delve into the CZ-198 facility located on an exotic moon in the Unknown Regions. The facility itself was run by Rasmus Bliss, a special executive of the Serpica Corporation. Bliss was a biochemist and cybernetics expert who would frequently produce bioweapons and other biochemicals for the company. Some of his weapons, such as the Vigilant, this being an augmented 6 meter tall flesh raider, would ultimately pose a threat to the galaxy and therefore need to be stopped by the player and his crew. The player, in an effort to stop the Circa Corporation's nasty experiments, would explore a vibrant daily zone with various heroics and weekly objectives alongside two new flashpoints both tied to the Rasmus Bliss story arc, these being both Circa Corporate Labs and Circa Core Meltdown. 
The Deadly Zone itself featured an abundance of rewards and secret items alongside a respective reputation vendor for the Ordnance Acquisition Corps as an Imperial Allied player or the Adjusticators for the Republic as a Republic Allied player. Uniquely, a rare mob would spawn in the Daily Zone that would further drop the Desla Explorer mount, leading to players farming rather constantly in the zone alongside the patch. With all these various activities within the zone, players found 2.3 to be an interesting addition to the Rise of the Hut Cartel expansion, with players being further treated to a new event that made the content patch even more exciting, this being the new Bounty Brokers Association Week, or BBA. During this monthly event, players going forward would travel across the known galaxy hunting down bounty contracts for the BBA. The event offered its own unique mounts, weapons and dies that further incentivized players to hunt down as many deadly NPC contracts as possible. In order to increase one's own standing with the Bounty Brokers Association, they would need to complete contract missions provided by BBA terminals on the fleet. These missions are split into two subtypes, Bounties and Kingpin Bounties. Regular bounties would grant medium reputation and could be completed daily, whilst kingpin bounties would grant higher reputation but could only be completed weekly and would often involve multiple steps. One such step being that players would first be required to complete five regular bounties. Each and every bounty had its own achievement accompanied by its own boss fight and weekly objective. These various achievements would grant titles such as Deathmark in Seven Systems for those players who managed to complete all eight kingpin bounties. The event itself was very well received alongside this content patch and gave players a reason to re-explore the galaxy outside of traditional questing. As a final content addition to patch 2.3, the developers added a neat Tauntaun quest on the planet of Hoth. The quest appeared seemingly out of nowhere and unlike other similar style quests, the Tauntaun quest did not have an adjacent reputation system attached, but instead had players farming for a Tauntaun mount. There were two variants of the mount the Mountain Tauntaun, available for 2 million credits or 20 Tauntaun domestication data, and the Tundra Tauntaun, which was available for 1.5 million credits or 15 Tauntaun domestication datas, but was limited to only subscribers. The player who did not want to pay would have to explore Hoth in an effort to find domestication data located at various Tauntaun nests. The nests were rather spread out and would not always offer the domestication data, which made the quest somewhat time consuming and unrewarding, but at the time served as an excellent credit sink to help balance out the economy for those who did not want to spend hours slogging around the planet Hoth looking for Tauntauns. After some feedback from the community, the developers decided to refocus on the game's foundation, with the devs now being rather satisfied concerning the game's newer subsystems, such as the Macro Binoculars and the aforementioned Daily Zones. It was clear now that Swotel would need to continue ironing out some of its older systems before moving on to newer ones. And upon reflection, the most profitable and controversial system outside of the subscription model that warranted change was the cartel market, with the most common complaint being that some featured items could only be obtained inside of loot boxes. The development team decided that changes needed to be made to accommodate some of the more frustrated players, resulting in the construction of an area on both the Imperial and Republic fleets, a new zone called the Cartel Bazaar. The Bazaar would incorporate the tried and tested reputation system and further add new reputation items to the cartel crates. These reputation items could also be obtained through various casino machines and other miscellaneous unassociated events around the galaxy. Initially the Bazaar simply required reputation and credits, but over time a new token currency would be introduced called cartel certificates that could be obtained through, again, cartel crates. This made even more of the RNG dependent items more accessible to any player who purchased cartel crates. Various vendors would then be placed around the bazaar with a connected reputation system to their own variant of the cartel crate. The developers would then also place some of the more highly sought after items in these vendors stores so that if players were perhaps unlucky with their cartel crate drops they could still then take advantage of the new bazaar system to guarantee the acquisition of at least some of the higher valued items. These improvements to the cartel market were considered by most to be a gesture of goodwill and ended up being some of the more supported additions to the game throughout its live development. This system further added event reputation vendors as a quality of life improvement for players who had the required reputation and funds to obtain items from various events without said players having to wait for an event to roll around. As a fun side bonus to the area, the developers put in a small parkour challenge to the bazaar that required players to reach the overwatch positioned above a loosely stacked pile of crates and scaffolding, which funnily enough made for a perfect parkour challenge. 
All in all, the Cartel Bazaar itself was a welcome addition to the game, and was merely a taster of the excitement to come. Which brings us to one of the best received patches that Swotel has ever had to offer. Some players even went as far as to coin this upcoming patch as the golden era of Swotel. Thank you all very much for watching part 2 of Star Wars The Old Republic Unmasked. If you liked the video, please feel free to click the like button down below, and consider subscribing to the channel. And if you have a few minutes to spare, you're more than welcome to leave a comment. I would love to hear your thoughts on SWOTOR, the current expansion, or even your thoughts on the video. I try incredibly hard to reply to as many comments as possible, and genuinely enjoy engaging with the SWOTOR community, so please don't be afraid to comment down below. On a side note, I have recently set up a community Discord for Star Wars The Old Republic players and enthusiasts. The Discord is looking to start regular events on the Starforge server, and further go on to play other MMOs between SWOTOR patches. The link to the community Discord can be found below in the video description. With that said, thank you all very much for your time, I truly hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you all in the next one.